Hi, my name is Paul Shore and you are watching The Street Speaks, a spontaneous speaker's corner for Montrealers. Why am I doing this? Well, last year I went around the city and I interviewed about 100 Montrealers in English and in French about a whole range of issues. But when I asked them, when was the last time a journalist or a politician asked you for your opinion about anything? Almost all of them said never. So this is my attempt at an unfiltered platform for Montrealers to express themselves about anything. Nothing is off limits. This week, Montrealers are ranting about their frustrations with our politics. They're speaking out about language as bond or barrier. They're raving about their moms and dads and how having children has changed their lives. Also, I've invited local singer-songwriter Kira Shaughnessy and comic Iman El Husseini up onto the Street Speaks soapbox. Are you like a, are you a political person? Are you politically engaged? Um, no, not like a very political person. Not really. I, okay. uh, no, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't even read the news anymore. Okay. Um. I, I, I go every time to the election and I put my vote, but I'm not that much into that. You just feel like your voice doesn't matter? I kind of. <laughs> I'm not happy with it in my case because I live uh, I live in a in a very very liberal riding, um, and whether or not I ever want to vote liberal, um, I'm frustrated that whether I do or don't, it doesn't matter. I don't even vote for uh, mainstream parties. I always vote to spoil my vote. I vote for the asshole that will never win anything. But at least you vote. Yes. My vote doesn't count. The riding always goes liberal, and I uh, I do have an issue with that. I I don't really see the point of going out to vote if it doesn't matter. I vote, but like uh, how should we say, holding my nose. Are you not interested, or do you, do you feel powerless? Well, it's a bit of bit of both. One party or the other, I'm not sure it's going to change radically something. When I was younger, I used to volunteer for the political parties. I realized at a certain point in time, no, it's all crooked. When somebody talks to me about the most important thing in our political life is the is economic, is the economy, they're lying in their bloody teeth because they have no control over the economy at all. They can't do it. Our political system is tied up and non-functioning. They can say all the nice things they want. You know, in the days of Trudeau, I, he would come on TV and speak what, what the people want. Now the politicians are speaking whatever they want, you know, how, how it's going to be. and So we don't see any horizon. My motto is we have a great country, the greatest in the world. It's the government that sucks. The government gets in the way. You see, I've been through all of this stuff. I hate to say that, but I sound like an old pedant, you know? I'm not a fucking pedant. But I'm tired of seeing the same dumb stuff going on all the time. We have a government that's non-functioning now. It, it still thinks it's in the Industrial Revolution. We're stuck horribly dying with the profit motive. It promotes greed, corruption, and wars, and killing. And the evidence is all around us. In, on the political sense, there's a problem of accountability that we are actually not accountable for the results, we are accountable to the message, the spin you can do, of the whatever you think is happening. Well, just by the way, at the bottom of the ballot that you have to sign, where you tick off, there should be a line at the bottom that says, none of the above, and it should be counted. The Montrealers are just getting started, no problem finding their voices. But now I'd like to welcome back to the show the Street Speaks house band, well, they're more like a street band. Andy G's finest, Paul and Chris Carniello, otherwise known as Skinny Bros.
language is a barrier because I, 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 my French is is not the greatest. I try my best. You sound like you're an Anglo. A what? An Anglo. Anglo, yeah. I How's your French? My French is pretty good. It goes up and down depending on what I do. <laughs> Are you in McGill or Concordia? Uh, or University UCAM? of Montreal. Okay, so you're doing it all in French. Yeah. Are you like completely bilingual? You must be. I manage. <laughs> Are you a Montrealer? I am, born and raised. Um, but there is always this barrier separating me from um, somebody that was born and raised here in, in Quebec. It's just a matter of fact. So when I was in university, I worked a lot of retail and all that kind of stuff. So my French was really good because I had to practice it all the time. And um, but you identify as an Anglophone or someone bilingual? Uh, yes, my parents. My parents uh, speak English at home, so. So, did you go to French? Tell me a little how you were studying biology in like, you go to Brebeuf or something like that? Or did no, you... I, uh, I went to French immersion uh, in elementary and high school, but uh, my parents, I guess, wanted to give me a good head start. And as much as I try to ignore it or try to overcome that, I still feel that barrier. And to add to the fact that I'm from Toronto and I'm uh, about, like, considered a, min a visible minority here, um, it just adds to the extra. Uh, obstacles and, and hurdles that I have to overcome here. You know, because of the neighborhood that I grew up in, because of kind of like the racism that we kind of got growing up, there was always this animosity that I had a little bit, you know? And, but that's not to say I'm not going to generalize the entire population of Quebec yeah. and, and to sweep this blanket statement over the entire uh, city and, and, and province. I, I love uh, bilingualism. I, I think uh, the fact that we have these two really different cultures um, gives the city a very unique flavor. I find uh, every other big city that I've been to in Canada and the U.S., uh, they're, they're all very similar. I find uh, there's something special and different about Montreal that I, I really like. I've met wonderful, wonderful people here, but, and then, but there's those just a, a pocket few of people that um, have I, I try not to let them get to me, but I, 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 I'll be honest with you, I've overcome several encounters with racism and stereotypes. But now that, like, my, pretty much everyone uh, that I work, that works for me, like all of my animators, they're all Francophone. And just having that kind of dialogue and talking about these issues that I always had Anglophone friends, and, we'd, you know, we'd all like, oh, it's stupid politics and what's going on. But it, being able to actually hear their side and, you know, understand a little bit, it's made me... Yeah, not to use the same word again, but more understanding. I guess it's opening up. I'm opening up more to, to it. But I am an Anglophone, yeah. I'm very proud to welcome to the Street Speak Soapbox local singer-songwriter, Kira Shaughnessy.
Never bit. been any different? Well, no. This is, the, we're at the tail end of the Industrial Revolution. That shit is all over now. And we have to find new ways of dealing with each other. Instead of this competitive crazy stuff that goes on in that beautiful building in Ottawa with those wankers sitting there in their goddamn suits and ties, nothing gets done. So we have to figure out something in terms of um, uh, taxation, standard of living, improving standard of living in, in, in um, Montreal. And they keep promising more, I hear it again, jobs, 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 jobs. Everybody's going to get jobs, lots of jobs, lots of it's bullshit. They have no control over the jobs at all. I've been listening to that since I was a kid. Um, lower, lower tax rates um, for um, big families. Higher taxes for the rich. Some sort of compromise bill or um, reform slash method for the middle class. Because lately, uh, ironically, the uh, middle class are actually the ones who are actually having a hard time right now. And what do the people really want? Are they pressing on the on the pedestal to really get what they want, you know? Not to force these guys out, but maybe to have different, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, agendas ahead, you know, different issues. The issues that are left out. It's not, it's not even the, the poor or the rich anymore. It's the middle class. And actually, that is a problem. Right there, that tells me there's a problem. I don't know what the problem is, but if you have the middle class um, trying to, you know, a paycheck away from being on the streets, Something's up. And I know a lot of people in that situation, whether they're professors, whether they're lawyers. Do you feel stuck? Uh, yeah, in some sense I do, that's right. I, why? Yeah, I do feel stuck. There could be more options, more alternatives, you know? But I don't see that. There's just other things, it's more business, it's more, you know? That's good too, because business world has to continue on. It has to upgrade itself, I understand all that. But uh, for people like me, yeah, I would feel stuck because I don't have the only thing I, I'm reaching out for is an income, and there's nothing else. There's no jobs, there's no... Uh... Uh, word got out today that they actually might... They're thinking of uh, raising the minimum wage to $15 as opposed to $8. It hasn't been uh, something that's um, on top of the agenda, but it's, it's been talked about. And then, even, even if you do get a job, uh, you get minimum wage. And what kind of a future is that? That's like being on welfare. You know, it's almost the same uh, income, you know? Maybe you can, you know, some companies you can, you know, uh, work your way up or, but there's not many opportunities like there used to be in the 70s. All that's diminished. It's all gone, you know. If that happens, I think you'll, you'll see a lot, of more, lot more people working and I think you'll see a lot more people actually getting out there and feeling good about themselves in, in terms of their self-esteem. <laughs>
It's extremely difficult. I haven't known any daycare in my life, so giving my children to strangers to raise them for eight hours, that is so why I give them, why I bring them to life if I give them to strangers. This idea, this concept did, did not exist. I have opposed the regime in Burma and I'm president for 10 years. Is it hard not having a family here? I think when you try to become a social reformer, you have to survive a lot of things in life. So I have to adapt wherever I am. It's part of my prison hood that I learned. You have to adapt to survive to the environment. Tell me about your relationship with your parents, because it's not common you see an 18-year-old guy who's like, my mom and my dad are fucking awesome. Well, they've taught me everything I know. You know, my mom, like, without them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really be the person, well, I would be the person I am biologically, but the person I am inside, like the views I have, they have a huge influence on that. My mom taught me everything I know about being a woman. I mean, she's great. She, my whole life, she raised us, she drove us to school every day, extracurricular activities, takes us shopping. My mom uh, really, really committed her life to motherhood and to making sure we had dinner at night and I couldn't have asked for a more giving and more loving parent. I, every day is a new starting for me. Every day is a new, a new search. I look for family who I can communicate with, for parents, other parents, uh, who are my kids' friends. Uh, I want to really get close to them, so I need to see who is comfortable with my children. What they've passed on from their experiences has greatly influenced my life and influenced who I am as a person so I'm deeply I'm deeply thankful for that. You say you had a good role model growing up? A great role model. I'm I'm still trying to fit into her shoes because she was a busy lady and uh, definitely had a lot going on all the time. I'm very happy to welcome back to the Street Speak Soapbox local comic Iman El Husseini. I don't believe in same-race marriages just because mixed people are a lot more attractive than full people. We see it all the time. Half Asian, half it doesn't matter. So hot. It's like a clear sign from God that we should have other people. And I never understood that misconception of sticking to your own kind, right? Like royal families did that a long time ago. They were incestuous to keep the blue bloodline going. They gave birth to deformed kids that died at the sight of sun. I'm convinced this is why white people can't tan today. That's why I'm convinced the next evolutionary step will be to discourage same-race marriages, especially for white people, to avoid things like asthma and allergies, you know, things ethnic people don't believe in. But when you're ethnic, you should mix with white to give your children hope. White it out is what I say, white it out. So, uh, so what do you love about the city? Uh, I love the energy. I love the. It's very liberal, uh, eccentric. Um, a lot of people come here to be themselves. I don't know. I didn't spend a lot of time in uh, in Toronto being gay, <laughs> but uh, certainly the roller derby community is a very queer and inclusive community. Um, so for me, yeah, Montreal and, and sort of queer community definitely comes hand in hand. And there's not really any problems here. Um, where I find if you go to other more conservative cities, it's a little more difficult to really kind of be out. Is that something that attracted you to staying here? Um, or, the, or not so much? I think it came after. Uh, I definitely stayed for, for sort of the city and, and uh, where I saw myself living in it and, and all of those things sort of came with it. Yeah. Here, Gay Pride, are you here because it's a party or do you feel a connection to supporting this community? A combination of both. It's really interesting because I was at Pride in Chicago last year and that was the first Pride event I'd ever been to and I was actually rather disappointed. It seemed like it was just a bunch of straight people there to party. Like everyone was pretty much naked and just drunk. Uh, have your people been kind and welcoming to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the most part? For the most part, for the most part. We can't say everybody, but the most part, they are really friendly. And uh, it seems to be taken a little bit more seriously here, um, which is uh, less disheartening, a little hopeful. Um, people seem to actually care about the cause, and yeah. yeah. 
the, the African community, the straight between brackets, when they notice that you're gay, they looked at you, they look really down at you. It's almost like you're not a human being, you know, you're less than a human being. And you feel really bad. So Even in here. Africa, yeah, 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 yeah. Some places. And in, in Africa, it's worse. Because there you don't have to be out, you must be on the ground. Because when you're out, it's like you're coming from Mars. I'm an ally, I believe in acceptance, I believe in tolerance, I believe in being able to be who you are, I believe in everybody accepting one another, not being judgmental, not discriminating. Um, and if a parade is what it takes, then a parade is what I'll join. <laughs> it's a good one, eh? Parade is <laughs>
Our hashtag is StreetSpeaks514, and if you want to get in touch with me, don't be shy. I'll be filming again very, very soon, and I can be reached at the StreetSpeaks514 at gmail.com, and I will reply. Also, next week, join me as Montrealers are speaking out about their amazing and distracting smartphones, how racism in some of our communities continues to persist, and their love-hate, but mostly love relationship with our city. Also, local dad and comic David Pride takes to the Street Speak Soapbox and shares a story of why having children is, well, selfish. See you next time. My name is Phil Penalosa, and you're watching The Street Speaks. How's that?